and i guess also depends on the aircraft you're flying and yeah um you know so i remember like uh, seven years ago i was flying more fixed wing aircrafts and you know you kind of just needed to make sure things are a lot more checked beforehand oh yeah uh, before you're flying fixed wings um and compass was an important part especially seven years ago um uh, and nowadays yeah you can probably get away with most dji drones you don't have to do is calibration every single time uh, no. but but still i see like you know i still see like a lot of our customers as well you know when they're operating they're still doing the compass dance because they're used to doing it and all habits die hard and i think when it comes to safety uh going the extra mile is actually going to pay you know, dividends do you know what varon i quite enjoy the compass dance <laughs> like careful look like an idiot it, it i quite is. i quite i yeah. quite enjoy it yeah. people always ask what are you doing i'm doing the compass dance doing the compass you don't dance. have to tell them you don't have to tell them why you just, <laughs> yeah. just do it and then leaves him with this yeah. little mystery yeah. why did yeah. the drone operator do a dance before he flew is it like a like a you know like rich a, ritual a ritual <laughs> I think we're recording. I think we are. I didn't get a little pop-up box that said, it's recording, got it? And you press the uh, got it button. That happened the first time, but not this time. Oh, really? Uh, Zoom is unpredictable. Yeah. <laughs> unpredictable Zoom. I've got yeah. disappearing ears again. You do? Oh, yeah. Um, it's, well, they're, they're doing better. Uh, it's, if I move kind of close to the camera, which yeah. makes me look a bit weird, not a bit weird anyway, that's better. I can't sit like this for the whole podcast, though. Yeah, anyway, bit, we'll be a bit stiff, but um, hello everyone. Hello, <laughs> happy new year to all our listeners and viewers and, and everything else. Um, we've got a lot of store this year, haven't we? We've got a lot coming up, mm -hmm. all of which we've talked about a little bit before the podcast, but we're gonna let, not let people know. <laughs> um, how are you, Varen? I'm good, Alex. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Did you have a good, yeah. uh, a good Christmas and new year? I did, and did you? Yeah, I did. I did, brilliant. You can see it in my face. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's not quite. I'm still the not new quite Alex. there. It's the, the 20, new me. 2023. The 20, yeah, Alex. the 2023 version. Alex 2.0 or 23.0. Where we want to put it? 2.3. That's better. I like that. Okay, so uh, today's little podcast, uh, we are going to talk about safety considerations for vertical flights, which include towers, facades, and turbines. There we go. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, safety considerations. Mm. Um, let's kick things off. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, safety is paramount mm -hmm. with drone operations. Yeah. You know, you, you, you're flying a, a, you know, a multi-rotored aircraft, whether it be, you know, the Mavic Mini or right up to the, you know, the, the big boys, yeah. like the Matrice 300. Doesn't matter what you're flying, you know, it's bad to be safe and sorry, not only for your 100%. aircraft, but for, you know, public and, you know, buildings, construction, property, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, safety is is paramount. Yeah. 100%. Oh, yeah. 100%. I think uh, it's, a, it's a really <laughs> interesting point because um, I think our industry is such a it's such a new industry. I mean, technically, with all the real commercial stuff is only 10 years, you know, in terms of yeah. age. Yep. Um, and it being such a new industry, I think that anything that anything negative can have a big impact. Um, and obviously you don't want to have anything negative, um, but it's because of, you know, flying hardware, mm. uh, that, you know, the industry needs to have the right sort of checks and balances and the right of sort of, you know, sort of, um, scrutinizing safety as much as possible because anything negative can have an impact and yeah. not just on the industry but on generally people so at, yeah. at the end of the day you know it's it's an unmanned aircraft yeah you know it, there's there's no one sitting in it yeah unless you're really tiny yeah. um yeah there's no one there's no one in it you are on the ground flying a piece of unmanned hardware yeah you know um yeah, we're told time and time and time again that 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 you know safety is safety is key. Yeah. Um, when when flying, when yeah. flying drones. Really. Yeah, that's a good point actually. So it's not only flying; it's flying unmanned. Mm. Um, and you know that presents a different host of challenges than yes. if it was manned. Even yeah. not saying that manned aviation has less challenges; it has probably just as much challenges, but yeah, different. If challenges. not more. If not more, yeah. Because you know, you know, commercial, 
commercial aircraft, you're not only looking after you behind the joystick, you've got however many passengers behind you or cargo or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. But I guess one of the things that's a sort of nice parallel between the two industries, and I think we heard this from Tana in our last uh, last week's podcast, is that you've got the process driven nature in both industries uh whereby you know you're following the right sort of checklists yep. um and they can be useful for not only enforcing safety uh but also ensuring the success of the mission uh and in the case of drones sort of collecting high quality data um so there are parallels between them even though they are quite different yeah i mean at the end of the day it's still something that's flying through 3d space yeah <laughs> true most sounds sci-fi, doesn't it? Three D space, yeah. Three D space a sensor in a three D space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh. you know, sci-fi is now. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, twenty twenty-three um, book title. Sci-fi if, is now. If I could, I would love to sort of see people um, from you know the fifties um, who were kind of, let's say, um, you know, um, kind of people in the fifties. If you could hear someone from, if you could get someone from the fifties to kind of like look at everything we're doing at the moment. Um, they would probably think of it like as a sort of sci-fi movie. Or well, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, the, the stuff that's happening now, you know, even back in the 80s, you wouldn't have really envisaged it happening, would you? Mm. I mean, commercial, you know, obviously commercial airlines have been around for ages, but, yeah. you know, someone standing on the ground with a remote control flying, you know, a tiny little helicopter with a camera on it. People mm. have gone, yeah. You're, yeah, you're nuts. Yeah, and it but, recon- reconstructing reality inside well, yeah. com- computers, you know. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. yeah, yeah. You know, you know. What if I said I could, I could go up there and, you know, you see that, see your house. I could, I could remake your house on yeah. my computer. People would be like, "What? Uh, yeah, no, yeah, uh, no chance." It's, yeah. it's, what is this? You know, what is this? witchcraft that you are you're talking <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. of <laughs> yeah and the witchcraft has changed over the last few years hasn't it so like yeah. i think uh the witchcraft initially was about flying these sort of simple 2d missions flying kind of you know single grid flying back and forth uh, on the same altitude stuff yep. that we have in our background actually <laughs> yeah um you know and um they were kind of somewhat simpler missions or i wouldn't say simpler but like i would say that they were kind of you know 2d you just sort of map an area yeah um but over the last maybe three to four years the kind of um the, there's been an emergence of more vertical flights mm-hmm. um so flying not just on one altitude but flying on many altitudes um and taking in data from many different angles um i mean that that kind of runs side by side with the advancement in technology as well doesn't it i mean the, the drones have now got better sensors mm-hmm. they've got obstacle avoidance sensors yeah. Um, you know, so these these things that couldn't have been done or were, you know, were not easily done mm. a few years ago are now, you know, almost an everyday occurrence for, for operators that use them in their, you know, in their day in, day out job. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't um, mean it's not dangerous, though. Which is <laughs> back onto safety. Safety. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Um. So speaking of these new missions, uh, what are the different sort of vertical, um, vertical types of flights, vertical missions? Uh, well, I mean, you've got moment? obviously, as as our, our podcast title says, you've got so tower missions. Mm-hmm. It's things like you know cell towers, water towers, chimneys, yeah. um, you know, uh, high rise buildings, mm-hmm. um, facades. Yeah. So building facades, you know, you can now, uh, as we have, you know demonstrated you can you can now photograph a facade and then if you want to you can actually 3d render that facade it's yeah. another vertical yeah. um and then you've got the mighty wind turbine yeah 100 percent. um which mm-hmm. you know it, again wind turbines is something that's grown in quantity over the last 10 15 years mm-hmm. uh and there's a lot more of them mm-hmm. you know and those wind turbines do need do need maintaining yeah. The last thing you want to do is climb up a wind turbine and and you know survey it manually. Yeah. So a drone is a perfect a perfect tool for that operation. Yeah. So there's your you know there's your, your your vertical 
missions in a you know in a nutshell yeah and there are specific incentives for why uh, maintaining those assets is important so wind yeah. turbine of course i mean given where we are with energy world over i think there are a lot of sustainability goals that yeah. are pushing um you know keeping the upkeep of these um, wind turbines as low cost as possible so that you can keep the operational time as high as possible and you know move towards a more sustainable future um with the facade side of things as we're seeing um also uh, predominantly in the us you've got kind of really high-rise buildings um which there is now a massive um um sort of uh, concern about the facades basically not falling falling over people and you know there is regulation on inspecting these facades every five yeah. years well obviously um, we had the large issue in london a few years ago yeah um in um, which unfortunately a lot of people lost their lives yeah you know that was that was a facade yeah. issue so that um, brought about the whole fire safety it did side of things yeah. it did indeed so, um and as we know, cell towers, towers is also um, another really rapidly emerging uh, area um, yep. where you've got thousands of cell towers um, in a country being surveyed. Uh, we, you know, we have a lot of inquiries about, you know, our product and, and um, cell tower inspection. Yeah. Um, you know, I think over the past sort of six months, that's been quite, that's been quite high up on the agenda, hasn't it? From, from not only the UK, but you globally, know, globally mm. we've had, we've had lots of inquiries. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. talking about cell towers, then um, let's talk about let's start with cell towers. Yeah, um, let's do cell towers. That's let's good. let's 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 think about safety for cell tower good place to start. Yeah. Um, so um, what might be some of the things to look at when you, you are looking at you know cell tower operation from a safety point of view? So I mean, the safety point of view with cell towers is obviously, yeah, you know, yeah. The cell tower generally are made of uh, you know a. Uh, a bolted together metal construction so you can mm -hmm. see the other side of it mm -hmm. if you're looking directly at it mm -hmm. but there's always the worry with um inspecting a tower mm -hmm. whether it be a cell tower or a tower block or, or whatever mm -hmm. is when the drone is round the back of that tower mm -hmm. you know if it's a cell tower not so bad because you can actually still see the aircraft mm -hmm. but if you've got something like a, a tower block or a you water know tower. A water tower mm -hmm. you've got the issue of of it's gone out of your sight and as yeah. a drone op my, you know obviously i'm a drone op myself the, something that's drummed into you from day one is always keep an eye on the aircraft you know yeah. you must have visual line of sight yeah it's you know it's it's like a second nature thing yeah. uh, um so you know there's there's that that safety aspect side of it um i mean the, obviously the the way the way around that is to have is mm -hmm. to have a spotters you know have a a spotting team mm -hmm. you know so when the aircraft is around the back that the spotting team can tell you exactly where your aircraft is what it's doing mm -hmm. um you know with, with our software which is obviously an automated platform mm -hmm. um you know the the aircraft will autonomously which is a great word um circle the circle the structure yeah giving you a little bit more security yeah. knowing that it's doing it because it's pre-programmed to do that and you're not manually doing it yeah um and on the point about the drone being on the back one of the things yeah. that we frequently see, uh, it's a frequently asked question, is that when the drone's at the back and you run out of battery, um, normally with DJI drones, what happens is you've got a go-home procedure, oh, yeah. uh, um, which means that the drone will um, basically go rise up and then basically fly through into the tower. Smash! Well, smash into the tower to try to get home. Um, so to basically circumvent that and to prevent some some of that from happening, all of that from happening, um, I think in Hammer Missions, we've got a, sort of a safety mode where the go home height must be higher than the height of the tower. Yep. And so the drone will rise, but it will rise much higher, at least 10 meters, minimum 10 meters above the tower, if not more, before it sort of comes back home, um, which can be really helpful in those scenarios to yeah. swap the battery. Uh, and also when it goes back, which is another in important consideration, it needs to first go to the height first, go home height first. And then it drops drone, down. And then drop down behind the tower yeah. as opposed to sort of, you know, going into the tower again. So now that what I did notice, obviously I went out and did a did a sail tower. 
um, as a an experiment for us mm-hmm. um, is that obviously from our from a planning point of view, mm-hmm. when you look at the map on Hammer Missions mm-hmm. or any you know Google Maps or whatever, mm-hmm. cell towers are always flat. Yeah. They're not going to be three D on the map, are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the first time I went out, I went out, I went out blind. Mm-hmm. And where I got there, and I was like, "Oh, okay." Mm-hmm. So I don't know the it, on my flat map, yeah, where the top of this cell tower is, <laughs> yeah. And that was kind of it was an experiment that that benefited benefited me mm-hmm. um, because it gave me an insight in how to do this correctly. Mm-hmm. So what we have in in Hammer is um, it fly to draw. Mm-hmm. So you you actually when you're in the field. You fly mm-hmm. over the top of the cell tower or mm-hmm. whatever tower you've got, mm-hmm. and you mark that as the top position, yeah. the middle of the tower, mm-hmm. and the software will automatically designate the flight radius around the tower. Yeah, and then obviously from there you can change your parameters. Yeah, as however you however you please. Yeah, and that to me is an absolute lifesaver. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, as the name implies, it's flying to draw, right? So you fly mm. the drone to draw the mission yep. uh, uh, on the map, and you're almost using the drone as a measurement tool at that point. Yes. And it's your little ruler to figure out the distances are correct <laughs> and your your heights are correctly set up. Um, and then you can be, you know, you can feel a bit more secure and you've yep. done your safety properly with respect yep. to the cell towers. Um, I think the other thing that is um, really concerning sometimes for people with cell towers is the sort of the the chances of magnetic interference or any kind yeah. of you know sort of because obviously it's a high if it's a high voltage tower you could have a high electric signal which can cause a magnetic field and you know yeah. that that can sometimes be um, an issue um, but um, yeah I mean what might be the methods to mitigate some of that um, you know I mean. Y- y- the easiest, obviously, the, the the easiest option is, as long as it's available to you, is having a larger sensor mm-hmm. and flying a further distance from said yeah. object. Yeah. You know, if you've uh, slightly different, if you're flying something like a you know a Mavic Two Pro, which only has a, a set focal length of twenty megapixel camera, although it's very good. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're flying something like an M three hundred, you could put a different sensor on it yeah. with a you know with a, a zoom feature. Mm-hmm. Um, the Mavic Enterprise range has the zoom feature, mm-hmm. so you could fly further away, set your zoom out, yeah. and then you know there you go. Magnetic interference is is nasty. Yeah, you know yeah, yeah. it can it, it completely throws you it throws you and your aircraft completely off kilter. Yeah, um, and you know it's it is it's not a nice experience. No, I've been there not. a few times myself, yeah. and it's it's very unpleasant. Because yeah. you just don't feel like you have any control of of what your um what your very expensive yeah. bit of kit's going to do. Yeah, yeah. it goes. Wee! Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, I guess um definitely. I think flying further away, if there is a mm. chance of uh, magnetic interference, is a great idea. Um, and obviously that might mean investment into um higher um sort of higher more capable cameras. Yeah. Um, but um, to detect whether there is magnetic interference in the first place, I guess there could be a pre-mission survey. Um, yep. You could use specialized equipment to read the sort of interference levels. Uh, or even if just you could walk up with the drone and see if the RC re- reports magnetic interference, you know. Um, so without before I mean, flying it, so you could just use it. There's, as a, there's also sensor. a lot of different rumors revolving around cell towers is that some high gain antennas mm. Uh, will cause your aircraft problems mm. i've never experienced that myself yeah um but i have had colleagues in the past that have gone well don't 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 fly in front of that mm. that'll knock your aircraft out of the sky that's something i'd like to i'd like to get clarified so if yeah. there is anyone out there listening or watching mm-hmm. that can say you know there are certain parts of a, a cell tower's antenna set up that you shouldn't get anywhere near yeah that'd be really good to 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 get that confirmed so at the moment it's just kind of a floating rumor yeah absolutely i I mean if you've flown so as alex pointed out if if you're watching or listening um if you've flown a sales tower mission and if it's gone well uh tell us about it in the comments Mm. or if it's not gone well 
tell us about it in the comments and it'll be great to discuss what could have been done better or or yeah like ways to make the safety better really so yeah yeah it's um, um you know cell towers are one of those things that are you know they're, they're not going away but they will need you know they will need inspection and maintenance yeah um so yeah, it'd be interesting to interesting to find out yeah. what, what people's opinion on you know inspecting a cell tower with a with a drone is you know yeah. and, and how people have done it brilliant um moving to facade inspections next subject next, next subject. subject uh so um again another type of vertical capture mm. but different host of challenges yes um right um what do we know about facade inspections um maybe we can talk about um uh, what does the it mail. typically involve the mail. oh the mail the yeah, mail so has we, to be mentioned we, yeah, yeah we, of course we've got to, we've got to chuck her in the mix yeah, yeah. Uh, i mean we've done we've done a few uh facade inspections on the mill mm -hmm. um for our own gain our own benefit mm -hmm. um you know facade inspections can come in all sorts of all sorts of packages i mean the, the mill's fairly easy although mm -hmm. it is behind a, a fenced off area mm -hmm. um you know, it's just, it's quite straightforward mm. when you've got things like, you know, I go back to towers when you've got like a, you know, a tower block and you need to do the facade, mm -hmm. you know, obviously you need to know, I mean, it's not with any facade, actually, you need to know your safe, mm -hmm. your safe distance from mm -hmm. the facade, mm -hmm. you know, so you're not going to slam into it. You may have a facade that has various bits that jut out mm -hmm. uh, or overhangs. Yeah, you know, there's lots of little, little bits and bobs that mm -hmm. that can cause problems with yeah. with facade, yeah. um, facade inspections. Yeah. But again, you know, you can use the fly to draw option. Yeah, with mm -hmm. facade, um, with hammer missions, um, you know, which gives you the option as the operator to fly the facade first in a mm -hmm. non automated manner. Mm -hmm. Uh, and mark those key points where you want the aircraft to fly. That way, you know you've gone out there and you've actually, you've actually physically marked those pointers. Yeah. To where you want the aircraft to go. Yeah. 100%. And you can avoid things like you know bits that are jutting out or overhangs or or whatever. Yeah. Uh, um, it's an extra safety feature. Yeah, and that that initial flight actually serves multiple purposes. One mm -hmm. is, as you correctly pointed out, the fly to draw to be able to mark the key GPS points for the start yep. and end of the flight path. Um, but also, I think <clears throat> one of the common challenges with facades, um, especially if you're in a dense built-up area, is that facades can unfortunately block GPS signal from getting to the drone. Yeah, um, which means that. Um, that gps may not be available you know throughout the facade and so knowing that beforehand in terms of if there is a gps denied spot in front of the facade um or if there is some level of gps loss that your experience might experience i think knowing that in a manual flight where you can take control uh yeah. is much better than finding it out in the automated flight um and in fact in hammer missions oh, yeah. we 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 are <laughs> in, in hammer missions if you're flying a facade inspection i think one of the um one of the sort of alerts that happen is we we kind of recommend that you take off the drone first manually acquire gps satellites yeah uh, as many as possible and if the number is high enough it's only then when the the flight will progress um uh, if you have single digit gps count that is not a good idea to single to... single digit satellites yeah never much fun especially no, the build no up go. area not so bad if you're out in the sticks i mean like mm. the, the mill for example is in the middle of nowhere mm. um but if you're you know if you're in a built up area it, you're right you know lots of tall buildings lots of glass lots of metal mm. can all disrupt a gps signal yeah. um and take it from me flying in natty in a built-up area is no joke it yeah. is yeah, it's yeah. it's scary yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> scary and fairly horrific yeah, yeah um you know because all of a sudden you've got an aircraft that has no no gps position mm. and it's it's literally a manual you know a manual bit of kit yeah. um and if you're not careful you know you lose orientation and before you know it 
whack yeah. you've yeah. you've hit something or someone yeah um luckily i didn't do either um <laughs> you know i did i'm i managed to bring it in and and land it and then reacquire gps keep my finger on them sticks and and hope for the best yeah. um so yeah yeah you're 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 right yeah um and as you mentioned earlier like maintaining the right um horizontal distance from the building um, yep. whether that's um five meters 10 meters i know dgi recommends at least 10 meters from most surfaces they the good thing is that they do have a lot of their obstacle avoidance sensing uh that kicks in um, yes uh, when you are close to a too close to a building or a structure and that would basically prevent the drone from flying um so um so and if it's in atty and then picks up an obstacle it will float mm, yeah so it'll course, pick up yeah. the obstacle but yeah. obviously it's got no gps positioning so it will it will bounce it will bounce around yeah so that's where piloting comes in to be able oh, to yeah. uh, to bring that's it where back the in old safely. school skill of the old yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. fingers or thumbs comes in <laughs> um yeah but uh, you, you're right a lot of the you know a lot of the very up-to-date aircraft being the, you know, the m300 and the m3e the sensors on those are are crazy um yeah. i think the m300 which is our, our hammer's own one mm-hmm. i had to tone the sensors down when i flew mm-hmm. it over the summer because yeah. it was just reacting to everything mm-hmm. you know if i walked under the drone not that you really should do that when it was in the you know in the air on takeoff the, the the sensors would go off that's even yeah. at height yeah, you know yeah. it'd pick so you know a lot of them are, are quite twitchy when it comes to to sensing stuff yeah um but better be safe than sorry 100 percent, 100 percent. um and i think the general approach to most of the vertical capture vertical flights missions i think uh should be to um uh, to have the approach of crawl walk run so you know start mm-hmm. small you know oh, start yeah. small take small risks not big risks yeah. learn acquire experience um then when you're confident go to the next level start walking start sort of taking yeah. slightly probably more intermediate risks and then you know and so i guess one of the examples is like if you're just starting out with a facade inspection start out with you know a building maybe in the middle of nowhere with just one facade as opposed to a built-up area and doing four facades at the same time you know yep. so uh it's just kind of it's all a learning thing. curve at the end of the yeah. day isn't it it's like it's like anything you yeah. know I've been I've been flying drones for seven years. This will be my eighth year, and you still learning stuff. Yeah, you know there is because you've got new challenges. You know, yeah. if uh, you might you might have flown somewhere lots of times, and then someone asks you to go and fly somewhere where you've never flown before, yeah. and there's obstacles and issues, and you get there and you you're learning again how to you know you can pull from previous experience. Yeah, but you need to adapt adapt and overcome yes there yeah. we go do. Book, book title the book title of the week adapt yes. and overcome <laughs> um yeah. and that brings us to um how do we best adapt and overcome when doing wind turbines Ooh. now wind turbines are a completely different kettle of fish yes um so obviously you've got onshore and offshore mm-hmm um i don't do offshore ever mm-hmm. doesn't matter whether it is whether it's a wind turbine or just going on a boat in general yeah. i don't get on boats because yeah. they make me sick as a pig yeah um just to clarify for everyone <laughs> we don't do wind turbines anyway. we don't no, no yeah. we don't do wind turbines anyway we, <laughs> yeah. we have just software designed to do wind turbines yeah, 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 yeah. but yes. we you know yeah. as a as a company we we don't inspect wind turbines <laughs> yeah. um now wind turbines Obviously, it's a you know it's a large structure, mm-hmm. uh, which again is where our flight to draw comes in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you know you depending on how you want to process the the wind turbine, mm-hmm. you you need to mark each blade, but you mm-hmm. need to do that manually mm-hmm. um, because there's no way of you know depending on where that blade actually is. Yeah. Um, you know, it could have stopped in the Mercedes position, so to speak, yeah. or it could be Safety. in the yeah. Mercedes position, yeah, or it could one. be in any rotation. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. You, you will need to manually, manually mark those points before yeah. you fly the mission. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. 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 
and I think it all depends with the wind turbines. It's so there are so many different flavors of wind turbine inspections. Are you inspecting one blade? Are you inspecting all blades? Are you inspecting the front and the back, the leading and trailing edge? Are you doing just one side? You know, are you sides? doing just the motor? Um, are you doing just the motor? You know, just yeah. the hub. Um, and as you said, the Mercedes position is it is it stopped in the six o'clock position or twelve o'clock position or some the other Mercedes position? position. Or the Mercedes position, which I think is yeah. the. I guess that's the twelve o'clock position, blade yes. straight up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the twelve o'clock. Yeah, Mercedes. So Mercedes. Um, so yeah, I guess you know there's a lot of different factors to consider before even uh, kind of thinking about hmm. safety, which is like what is it that you're doing, and therefore the safety is a function of what you're doing. Um, yeah, and you know if you're doing like uh, all three blades, all sides in one flight back and. You know, and making the transition from the back to the front all yep. in one go, that's a different level of operation than doing yeah, one yeah, blade you know, up that's, and down. There's, there's obviously different experience levels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want to, as again, our recommendation would be start with start with one blade, one side. Yeah. Don't go, I'm going to do the whole lot in one hit. Yeah. Um, you know, it's... <laughs> it's a it's a it's a risk yeah. um again distancing mm -hmm. you know like the facade mission mm -hmm. you want to keep your distance yeah you know you don't want to be stacking it's crashing into one of those yeah, yeah um, definitely not yeah you know because they're an ex they're an expensive bit of kit not only will you muller your expensive bit of kit you'll also do damage to someone else's um which is going to be a lot more expensive than your drone <laughs> um you know uh yeah uh, automation with manual adjustment yeah yeah 100%. Without, without a doubt you couldn't fly one of those things automated straight off the cuff you'd you'd have to you'd have to manually pinpoint each part of the blade that you want to do whether that be one blade front or one blade front and back or all blades front and back manually mark those positions first yeah then fly your mission yeah if there any doubt at any time you know, you feel uncomfortable, stop the mission, bring it in, reassess. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that and that can be applied to any type of vertical capture. Yeah, um, you know, do not uh, push the, do not try to sort of push it beyond uh, no. the where where it needs to be. So, um, yeah, and I guess that kind of brings us to you know, we could talk about some general safety considerations mm. to, that applies to like all kinds of vertical capture and yep. potentially like to all types of drone missions as well. But specifically... whether that be automated or, yeah. or, you know, or anything else, even just general flight, yeah. uh, general drone flight, there's always things to take into consideration. Yeah. Um, you know, the major one mm -hmm. is, is loss of GPS. Yeah. You know, 100%. it brings us on to, you know, sort of safety considerations. Yeah. You know, loss of GPS is a is a massive one. Mm. Um, you know, which every drone pilot has experienced or yeah. will experience at some point. Yeah. Um, you know, at the end of the day, your little your little aircraft is relying on a global positioning system mm -hmm. to let it sit where it's sitting. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. that might not work. Yeah. For whatever reason. Yeah. Um, so Learning how to fly in atti mode it's a good idea. Is, is essential. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of aircraft now mm -hmm. don't have the option to turn off GPS. GPS, yeah. You know, yeah. gone are the days of the Inspires where you just like go, just flick, turn flick GPS a switch. Off. Yeah. yeah they, they don't really do that anymore. The way you'll find out that you've lost GPS is when your aircraft says no GPS, no GPS yeah. atti mode. Yeah. And but then... I guess I guess a good way to still train is to train on a non-GPS aircraft. Yep. Uh, which, you know, you can even find these sort of like toy aircrafts on, uh, sort of to fly indoors if possible. Um, yeah. Just toys really. But it's almost, it gives you that feeling of understanding it's how it is to fly almost in space where you've got to constantly correct and you know yeah. you don't have the stabilization that GPS offers. So you know if you push the stick, you're going to keep going. You got to sort of bring it back uh, if you wanted to go back. So yeah, constantly recorrect the um, recorrect what the drone would do in atti mode uh, because it has no sense of positioning. Um, but I think that over time, um, with vision sensors also kicking in, and as we've seen with not just DJI but other drones as well, 
there's going to be a combination of vision and GPS positioning. Yeah, which yeah, there will see. be. Yeah, and I mean, so, e- yeah. even now when you bring a Mavic in to land, yeah, it knows where the ground is. I mean, yeah. I know you can turn that off, but it will hover at a certain point and then it will land. Yeah, because it knows it knows where it, it wants to be. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, the first I, the first aircraft I flew in Atty was a hexacopter, mm-hmm. big one, meter across. Yeah. Switch the atti, you know, switch it to atti mode and just watch it go psycho, yeah. and then try and try and bring it back in. Uh, you know, that's a di- completely different ball game. Yeah, you know, if you get the opportunity, mm-hmm. learn to fly atti. Yeah, even if it's only just a little bit, figure of eights. Mm-hmm. You know, b- taking it out and atti, bringing it back in and and landing or taking it out GPS, turn, you know, turning it over to atti, bringing it back in and landing it. Yeah. Just have some experience of of how to fly an aircraft with no GPS, yeah. Um, because it, you know, it it might be a lifesaver. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and I think that's that's just something that you have to do in your training. Some of yeah. the other components on the aircraft to um, to look out for, because GPS is a quite critical one. Yep, but it's not the only one. Um, yep. You know, you've got the compass. Uh, you've got the IMU. Um, yeah. So I think some of those are also extremely important for obviously the correct orientation of the drone. I mean, we're quite again, we're quite lucky now with with the upstate aircraft that mm-hmm. compass calibration isn't always in a set. Well, it is a necessity, but it will tell you yeah. when your compass needs calibrating. Yeah. Back in the days of the Inspire One, and yeah. you know the the aircraft I had before that, yeah. um, we used to calibrate the compass before every flight. Yeah, you yeah, did yeah. The, you yeah, did the, you compass... the dance, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. the compass dance. calibration dance. Yeah, I remember like an that absolute too. Muppet. I remember that too. Um, uh, going standing around. on a standing on a film set. Yeah, just going dancing around, around yeah. dancing around with this drone. People <laughs> like, what is he doing? Yeah. Um, you know, look, we're kind of lucky now that that you, you know you don't have to do it every time. Yeah. Um, it's it's worth doing. Um, you know, especially if you've changed areas. You know, if I've gone for you know gone from say here up north, it's worth it's worth doing it, even for those tiny little, you know, mm-hmm. tiny tiny little calibrations. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, compass calibration yeah. worth looking at. Hundred percent, yeah, and I guess it also depends on the aircraft you're flying, and yeah, um, you know, so I remember like uh, seven years ago, I was flying more fixed wing aircrafts, and you know, you kind of just needed to make sure things are a lot more checked beforehand oh yeah uh, before you're flying fixed wings um and compass was an important part especially seven years ago um uh, and nowadays yeah you can probably get away with most dji drones you don't have to do is calibration every single time uh, no. but but still i see like you know i still see that like a lot of our customers as well you know when they're operating they're still doing the compass dance because they're used to doing it and all habits die hard and i think when it comes to safety uh going the extra mile is actually going to pay dividends you know, do you know what varan i quite enjoy the compass dance <laughs> like careful look like an idiot it, it i quite is. i quite i quite enjoy it yeah. people always ask what are you doing i'm doing the compass dance the compass you don't dance. have to tell him you don't have to tell him why you just, <laughs> yeah. just do it and then it leaves him with this yeah. little mystery yeah. why did yeah. the drone operator do a dance before he flew is it like a like a you know like R- a, rich ritual a ritual thing <laughs> and uh if they'd asked i'd have said yes it's my it's my ritual that's it um uh yeah and i guess uh sorry i threw you there yeah, completely no, no 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 i was just yeah, now i'm starting to think you know it's like almost a prayer before every flight and you yeah. have this ritual and sometimes <laughs> sometimes you do need a little prayer before every flight <laughs> um yeah and um uh, what else so we've got so we've covered G- gps we've covered compass um uh some of the other things to uh potentially look at um before vertical flights um that are particularly important signal loss signal loss uh like uh, uh the radio signal loss right yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. i mean again you know these days uh, signal loss will you know will trigger a trigger a return to home or yeah. a hover or however how you've however you've got it set up set it up yeah mm-hmm. um obviously with a return to home you know i would make sure that the return to home was was set to as high as you know as high as you're comfortable with Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people set theirs to 400 feet. Wow! Yeah, 
and goes all the way up yeah. in the air yeah. and then yeah. flies back at 400 like, feet and then comes yeah. down. The yeah. only issue with that is, of course, you've got to have the battery to get to 400, come yeah. all the way back at 400 and come down from 400. Yeah. Um, so it, it's worth checking your, your, you know, your RTH mm-hmm. before you fly, mm-hmm. see what it's set at, yeah. uh, make sure you're comfortable with it, that it's yeah. not going to impact on your battery. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you never know when, when all, you, your kit might have a wobble. Yeah. Um, you know, I've known, I've known Mavic controllers to be working fine and then fail halfway through a flight. Mm. So, you know, all of a sudden you've got no controller, mm-hmm. your drone will just literally come home. Yeah. You don't want it to hover in a situation like that. Cause you're not going to get it back. Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, it's worth checking wh- how your return to home is set up. Whether it's set up to to hover, return to operator, return to home point. Yeah. Um. And your and your RTH. Yeah. Height. Yeah. And and all of those things are closely linked to the battery swap because obviously yep. when you run out of the battery, um, the the parts the drone is going to take to come home is going to be the same RTH go home part. Um. And so that if you've got indeed. a setup to go to four hundred feet and then come down with a battery swap, that's not a great. <laughs> No, you know, don't when you're running do that. Out of, when you're running out of battery, that's yeah. like the last thing you want to do. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess pre-planning, if it's a facade you're doing or a cell tower or a wind turbine, having some idea of like where the drone might run out of battery and what the flight yeah. path will be from that point um, is a good pre-flight safety check because um, they just allow you to prepare. It's all in. It's all in pre-planning, really. Yeah. Um, and you know something that a lot of people don't do is have um an emergency landing area yeah i said that like i was drunk emergency landing area. have an emergency landing area yeah. um you know because if your if your current landing area gets compromised yeah like my ears <laughs> there we go <laughs> <laughs> um, you know yeah. for whatever reason yeah um and you can't physically land there mm-hmm. um which i i have experienced in in filming before mm. um it was tourists <laughs> right uh, ingress of tourists um you need somewhere else where you can safely land right yeah 100%. That's, that's not going to have you know not going to have issues so you know generally try and think about an alternative landing, landing spot. spot yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah um, i mean it's yeah. different if you've if you've got an area cordoned off mm-hmm um but again you you never know what might happen to that particular area it's always good to have an additional area to be able to to drop your aircraft just in case yeah and it's not unique to our industry i mean uh, i think aviation like general aviation has been doing this for a long time i mean they whether or not there's an emergency the the ground teams are constantly supporting aircrafts to know where they can and cannot land at any given point in time and they have multiple options being built in real time so i think obviously this is nowhere near the same scale but i think as a general principle you know as a pilot you've got to build multiple options in your mind uh, in real time and make those decisions really quickly because yeah. um, that's what safety is all about. Kind of yep. pre pre having a sort of uh, kind of like a preconceived idea of what might happen and then being ready to mitigate. Uh, it's all about pre planning. You know, the same when you drive. Mm. You know, you're constantly looking ahead yeah. at, the, at the road, not only because that's the way you're going, mm-hmm. but you got the whole hazard awareness. Yeah, and the same. You know, the same runs when 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 flying drones. Yeah. You are constantly, or you should be, constantly looking at what hazards may crop up, yeah. whether it be, you know, I mean, t- nine times out of 10, it's birds, to be fair, <laughs> uh, especially at the mill, because you get lots of flocks of pigeons. Uh, you know, the same if you're flying on the coast, you've got seagulls that mm-hmm. don't like drones in general. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's always, it's it, it, hazard awareness is is definitely, uh, you know, it's it's something you need to look out for extremely important yeah um and yeah i guess uh and always having an eye on the drone or being able to not or but and being able to see what the drone can see yeah Uh, so you know the video video feed is looking good from the drone and it's not sort of choppy or taken over or something or or blacked out and also that you can see the drone at all times um, yeah it's also important it can be hard when you know you've got a really tiny drone like a mavic 2 pro sometimes and you know it's sort of you know, it's well, they're in the throes of changing away. the rules, aren't they? Visual mm-hmm. line of sight rules. Um, 
which I'm not going to discuss here because it's CAA territory. And yeah. I'm not going to get involved in that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you know, the, the 500 meter boundary, um, mm-hmm. you know, especially now drones are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. You know, you've got a Mavic 3 Pro at 500 meters. Yeah. Yes. Are you going to see it? Yeah, you really have to use screens really hard sometimes. And yeah, you, know, you got to use uh, some other equip, specialized equipment yeah. or so, spotters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, safety, safety, safety. All safety. Um, all safety. Yeah, but ultimately, I think at the end of the day, drones are. People think of drones as cameras, but they're flying cameras, which makes yeah. them uniquely different. Yep. And yeah, I does. think, and everything with flight has to have safety built in. Um, yeah, and that's at the heart by industry, isn't it? So yeah, I mean, and the drone manufacturers are, you know, they've they've taken note of that, and mm-hmm. they are starting to, well, not starting to, they've been doing it for a while. They're, they they they're putting sensors in their in their aircraft mm-hmm. that will give some warning for the operator to stop and you know sense and avoid. Yeah is what you know what it's generally called um which is great but nothing beats eyes on you can have as many sensors as you want around that thing you know you can't rely on all of them to work all the time yeah you know at the end of the day the person that has the controller in their hand is controlling that aircraft they should be aware of what they're doing the safety aspects and the hazards that that could pop up at any moment yeah and they're the ultimate uh, person in charge and responsible so yeah yeah they have to have yeah. to do that yeah um but yeah all of that said um i guess we don't want to sort of dissuade people from, <laughs> we don't want to put we're, people we're, off we're, we're, from the vertical <laughs> missions or vertical flights i think that um vertical missions are challenging um, yes but they are possible um yep and they just require patience skill learning and they are rarer than some of the other mission types. So we think that, you know, it can be a great differentiating factor for a lot of people that are doing these missions because the data they're collecting may not be possible to collect in other ways, um, especially when drones are competing with, let's say, satellite or any other type of data. Yeah. I think the vertical data can be very hard to get from any other source. Uh, and it either is too expensive if you use something like a cherry picker to do that inspection uh, or it's, it's scaffolding. Just, you know, scaffolding. again, scaffolding is the expense. It's yeah. got to go up. You've got yeah. to get out there, have a look at it. Then it's got to come down. It's, you know, whereas drones make life, you know, make those sort of operations easier, less time consuming and probably cheaper. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're a cowboy and you're charging loads of money. <laughs> but, you know, in general, they are, they are cheaper uh, and quicker. Hundred percent to do, yeah, brilliant. So yeah, Ooh, I guess that was that... a good. That was a good chat. I like yeah, that. That was a good one. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah, safety first, huh? Safety first, folks. That's what it's all about. Not to be dissuaded from you know from getting out there and flying. You know, we're not trying mm. to scare you into not doing it. Um, you know, there's thousands of people out there every day flying flying drones safely. Um, we just thought we'd put our oar in. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes a good Brilliant. podcast too. Yeah, it does, yeah. Uh, so there you go. Awesome. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Farron. Um, as per usual, uh, you know, it'll be uh, it'll be on, on YouTube. You can mm. add a add a comment below. Um mm. be nice to have some more comments, see what see what people think, get some um get some kind of ideas flowing. Um drop us a yeah, drop us a like and a subscribe. Mm-hmm. Um we are also on uh all your favorite podcast directories in audio format um if you need to get hold of us we are on team at hammermissions.com and that is it for this week that's I it yeah brilliant awesome all right thanks Alex. Nice one, Baron. all the best uh, all i shall the... speak to you soon yeah catch you soon catch you soon all right, all right. Cheers. cheers bye bye bye